Hello and welcome to the Chris Will Podcast on iCode Media. Today I had a great conversation with Dr. Tommy Pinkston, 36, from North Carolina. We had a lot of fun talking about F3, talking about our practices, talking about vision source and, and what all of those things mean to us. I really enjoyed our conversation. It, it's always fun to get to know Tommy better, and I hope to, to have some beatdowns with him in the future. Uh, as always, please ensure, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, write a review, share it with your friends, and support those support us. I want to talk about the My Day Multifocal for a second. We had the opportunity to do a preclinical trial with this lens this last summer. And there were a couple of things that I thought were really helpful. The first one is that it is different than a lot of the multifocals that we've used before in our practices where patients, especially early emerging presbyopes, really managed the, it didn't cause a lot of additional uh, distance blur for them. And the other thing that was really helpful was because we've never been involved in a clinical trial before was to understand uh, the sort of questions that we might ask our patients. And we ask a pa- our patients a lot of questions about their, pati- about their satisfaction with a contact lens, but what we weren't doing was actually having them score that themselves. So one of the parts of this that was really interesting to me was asking patients on a scale of 1 to 10 how they would score their vision, how they would score their comfort in their current lenses, and then how they would do the same on their uh, new lenses. And it showed me a lot of times where patients would say they were happy, might rate their vision as a six or a seven. And um, and then it also reframed their thinking about their current satisfaction in their lenses and allowed me to open up the door to offering other solutions. So if you haven't tried something like that in your clinical practice, I would encourage you to. And I would also encourage you to try the My Day Multifocal for your patients. What do you think about your macular degeneration supplements for patients in category one through category four? Do you feel like you have a really good way to distinguish between what type of supplement you're using and why you're using it? I'd encourage you to check out the evidence behind MacuHealth. We've used it in our practice for a number of years now, and we have a real great solution for patients in category three and four, as well as supplements for patients who don't need the full AREDS formulation. We've been really impressed in our practice by the way it performs and also by the patient acceptance of those supplements. And MacuHealth has also been a great partner in our practice to help us with resources and tools to help us describe and define why their supplements are more bioavailable than some of the things that patients can find at a supermarket or a drugstore. And the most important thing for me about having a supplement in our practice for patients to have access to is I can know whether or not they're getting exactly what I'm prescribing. So that seems to be really helpful for my patients because they're not scouring through the aisles trying to pick up something and having that 10 minute evaluation of what type of supplement they need. So if you haven't started using MacuHealth in your practice yet, you can find all their information in the show notes and they definitely have something that is worth your patient's time and worth your patient's vision. Um, so thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, man. I'm excited to connect. I know we've, I've watched you do uh, coding stuff for a little bit, and then I realized you're an F3 guy, and that's cool, man. Yeah. That's How pretty long have awesome. you been in? Uh, in <laughs> it sounds like we're talking about prison, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've started our F3 chapter in, about almost four years ago. Um, in our, we have a small town of about it's about ten thousand people in Western North Carolina, and so we started a buddy and I. I don't. Uh, he came up to me, I think, and he's like, "Hey, we should we should start this group in Waynesville," and I was like, "All right, let's do it," you know. And so we hadn't even been to a been to a workout. Like we we're just like we read about it. We went to church together, him and I, and I was like, "This sounds like this sounds like something that we would right up our alley." And we'd kind of run and just done some you know, little workouts here and there, but nothing legitimately like F3. And then we went to Asheville, which is about a 40 minute drive and, you know, became official F3, F3 guys. And, and then they're like, all right, you guys going to do this. And so, you know how they just kind of, if you show leadership capability, you're going to be thrust into that, whether you like it or not. And so we were, we just jumped into it and we started hitting the ground running and then they helped us um, really that was helpful in terms of just teaching us uh, how to get that launched and we just found a, a good close knit group of core guys, and that was about four years ago. So it was, it's been pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm going to read you something, um, and I'm going to change some of the words because I think the audience who don't aren't familiar with F3 parlance will understand a little bit better. But I want to get your reaction. Uh, a new guy worked out one morning. He puked and otherwise, in his mind and only in his mind, disgraced himself. At the end of the workout, 
he got his F3 name in the circle of trust and was dragging his butt back to the car. And he stumbled accidentally into the leader for that day, who was obviously admiring his pecs in the window of his Lexus. The new guy must have felt a little weird because he went ahead and blurted out what was on his mind. He apologized for, quote, slowing the group down. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many times I've read this, and I, uh, I can't get through it without doing what I'm doing now. Um, the leader laughed and replied, yeah. <laughs> he hadn't slowed anything down. Quote, anyway, the Q told the FNG, or the new, the new guy, quote, brother, you're the reason we're here in the first place. You are why we're here. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've thought about that. I've thought about that for, um, you know, years. And, um, and I don't know why I'm so moved by it, because... Uh, it, it really, like, could I go a long life without, you know, the men that <laughs> surround me? Uh, yeah, I could. But I think one of the things that moves me about it is that I think there's so many other people that are going through life. Um, just sad clowns, right? <laughs> it's, it is, I mean, it's a powerful, it's a powerful group, and I think, I, I think for, for men, no matter where you're at in life, you know, whether you're a 15-year-old kid or you're 80 years old, there is something just uniquely primal about needing to have male leadership and invigoration. It's just part of, I think, who we are. And I think that naturally, you know, we get in business or you get in professional life, you want to build these walls. Like, I have no imperfections. I, mm, I'm, yeah. I'm a strong man. And, and, and there's this conflation of weakness not being manly in, in a sense, right? And so then you go to F3 and you think like, okay, I'm a professional. I, I'm, you know, I may have my business or whatever I'm doing professionally and I've got my family. But then the workout, for lack of a better term, it's going to kick your ass. The first time you're out there, there's no way around it. You're going to get your butt kicked. Like, and you have just got to be ready to be humble. And I think when you're that vulnerable with that many open men without even knowing what, like you got usually, you know, one or two guys. Three, if you're really, you know, if you're really already part of it, and then you're just, you, you have to be vulnerable, and it, and I think it's, it's very different than most things that we're a part of professionally or personally. That you know, hey, it's we're we're happy you're here, and we're happy you're suffered, and we're better because you suffered, right? And we're better because of it. There's no, it's not about winning or losing. It's about just being being vulnerable. And I think that's the powerful thing about um, about any really. Um, powerful group, but particularly with F3, it's just, you know, you, you show up and, and, uh, it, it's powerful because of the fact that we're all there in, it's about the struggle. It's not about the results, right? It's not about that. I can do a hundred pushups quicker than you can, or, or vice versa, or we can, who can run faster. Like that's, that is, that is for other times that, you know, in other avenues, this is more like, Hey, we're going to struggle together. And that struggle is going to make us stronger as a group and stronger as individuals. And I think it's really hard to, to know what that's like until you've been a part of that. And I think guys who've like, who've done collegiate sports or like been a part of the military, they kind of understand that a little bit. Cause it's not, you know, it's not about whether our team won the championship. I mean, it is, but it's really not like um, you have those, those collective, uh, 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 relationships throughout your life. And F3, I think just, it's like that on steroids. I mean, it's just, it's, it's hard to describe. Yeah, it is. I think the, you know, my reflection and seeing that again, um, I was, in really good shape when I started doing F3. I just wanted a different workout and I didn't realize, um, you know, the other aspects of it, but you see, I mean, that story, uh, I see guys like this all the time, new guys that come out and they're apologetic for being the last in line. And you see just, um, you know, the, the best in shape of all the guys kind of coming back and they don't have to, they're not, they're not, um, I was reflecting on this with, this morning at a, in a pre-run with, with some of my buddies and, they're not like dragging you along. Come on, man, you could do this because that would be off-putting right away if you didn't know the guy. Mm -hmm. We had an event this weekend that um, that I wasn't aware was a competition at first, but it, it was like at, on Friday. It was a Saturday event. It was a fundraiser, um, and there were about twenty groups of about four to six people in every group, and um, and one of one of my so we want we wound up winning, but I should send you the video. They put it on Twitter, but 
Uh, the last thing we ended with after six miles of running and probably over a thousand different reps doing other things, we ended with 50 burpees and a 50 yard duck walk. And I, I promise you, <laughs> if I wasn't, if somebody wasn't there in this case, because I knew them and trusted them, right. And I have been through the hard parts before, uh, if if I hadn't been through that, if they would have just gotten after me when I first got out and I didn't have a trust, you know, I didn't trust them and they were like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Like <laughs> I would have, I would have just, I would have been like, oh, I don't, I don't care about you guys. But the fact that we have done that for years, um, well, almost two years, uh, and, um, and they were kind of getting after me. I, I had already been through difficult things. They knew what I needed when I needed it. And, um, yeah. and so I think the point is, is that, you know, knowing that you've been around for a long time and you see the guy that's, you know, hundred pounds overweight and he's there for the first time and he's just trying to keep up, uh, but not saying anything to him when he doesn't need something said, he knows, he knows he's out of shape. Um, all he needs you to do is be there for a while and then right. he needs you to kick him in the butt when he needs it. Once you've built that relationship. Right. It, it's yeah you don't want to come across patronizing it's very important <laughs> you know you know because it's like well yeah I'm, I'm here because i'm trying to get better so just just hang with me for a minute you know but i mean i i think that the physical aspect is only one part of it i think what i think most guys really come back for because i've talked to some guys where you join f3 and your fitness levels go up and then as your fitness level go up you're part of this group and then not that it stagnates but you could get a better workout elsewhere i mean i don't, I don't mean that man i just mean like if you really want to go and you could do you crossfit know, you could do like yeah i don't mean that that's not a negative thing against f3 that is what keeps it coming back is not that it's the hardest workout that you could possibly do it, it is for some guys and i don't mean that i don't mean that mean i think for 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 me and for a lot of guys as you keep coming back you come back because it's a challenging workout and you can make that as challenging as you want but I think the mental aspect for me, like, you know, I just a little bit about me. I so we joined F, we started F three about four years ago, and I'd lost my father seven, almost seven years ago. So I lost my father to suicide mm. um, unexpectedly. He was in his mid fifties, and so that whole mental aspect of men's health for me, and I, I don't tell. This is probably the first time I publicly even said that. Mm. Um, and the reason I said that is because I don't, you know, we don't know each other very well. But you're an F three guy, and we, we come from similar kind of similar backgrounds. But um, it that is something I think that men don't really realize because it's underneath the surface, right? You have successes that you try to you know show off on social media or whatever it is, or and then there's this part of, of vulnerability that is part of that group that you know when you have a really tough time that you need to you need a buddy to just hey i just i just need somebody to just listen to my issue just for a minute just be vulnerable that's the first guys you're going to go to right i mean that's a guy we may be doing middle push-ups i'd be like hey man i'm i'm struggling right it might be coding help it could be whatever <laughs> but like we it's just it's that availability to have that vulnerability because you know you've suffered um physically with these guys and that you feel like there's a, a trust built where you know, you might have a professional colleague that you trust very good, but you're not going to have that vulnerable conversation about stuff, you know? Yeah, I think that's the, the hard part is that, you know, especially in a profession that's small and also great, um, there's, if you, well, I, I think it's, it's worth having a conversation about Vision Source within this too. I mean, I'm just bringing this in because I think there's a professional aspect to that, right? Like everybody thinks about Vision Source as like a, a buying group, right? That's the first thing that comes to their mind. But it, it actually is is way deeper because you're you're breaking down you know you're you're starting to trust each other's opinions about what they're doing what you're doing clinically what you're doing in business and then pretty soon you're you're trusting each other's judgments and encouragement when because you know they have your best interest at heart as opposed to even our you know in a lot of ways like our state associations can f fulfill a lot of things like especially politically that nobody else can do from an educational standpoint. You know, there's, there's things they can do that nobody else can do. Um, but there still is, you know, once you get to the heart of it, there's still this little bit of like, well, ah, this guy might still think he's my competitor and he's right down the yeah. road. I don't think he's my competitor, but he might think he is. And so when I ask him something or he comes to me with, with a question, the question is like, are you going to be as sharing as, as I'm going to be? Right? There's this little, I think right. in the back of a lot of our heads, and I think Vision Source allows us to remove that. This isn't a Vision Source conversation, but it allows us professionally <laughs> to remove that. And F3 does the same thing. And so it breaks down those barriers, as you say, and gets us away from having friends who are 
professional friends, but we can't be vulnerable around them, right? So I, I probably right. went too far on that reading that I went on, but I guess no, you're you're fine, yeah. man. I, I I think it's helpful. I mean, like, right? We only I, I'm. I'm very much the believer that we only grow when you're vulnerable or in times of discomfort, right? Whether that's physical discomfort, right? Like if I, if I, um, if I just do everything that's comfortable, right? Professionally, personally, it's, it's going to be stagnant, right? It's going to be stagnation. And so I think that's important just even from a, from a per, uh, professional standpoint, right? Like I'm, I can only grow where I'm vulnerable and I have problems, right? If I have all the, the, the f- things figured out, then I don't need any help. And that's just, very naive of me to think about from a personal and professional standpoint. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of parallels between both groups, right? I mean, not only the vulnerability, but trying to, to engage leaders, right? You want to kind of help groom the future leaders of, of your profession. And just like you want to help groom the future leaders of, of F3 or whatever within those circles, right? If you even, you can see, you know, I love it when the guys come and you say, Hey man, it's your time to queue. And you're like, like, nah, I'm not ready. I'm like, well, you're never going to be ready, so you just need like, and you kind of have to push them a little bit. And some are really eager, and so it's interesting to see those leadership, those people, um, kind of go through the ranks and kind of figure out like, hey, you know, I think I'm ready now. I'm like, man, you were ready six months ago. Like, it's all right. You're going to mess it up. It's going to be awful. No, it's people are going to be complaining about it. Just keep going. Just tell them to do it. Hush and keep moving. You know. And so um, I, I love seeing that type of thing and getting people involved in in those organizations and seeing them be successful i think for me i think that's huge like just in optometry in f3 it's just it's cool seeing i'm not i i wish i was better at that i I think there's some really good guys that are that are great at identifying leadership capabilities and others i think that's probably not as not a great um thing that i do have you gotten better at that or are you just naturally good at it um i don't I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like I've tried to get better at that over time. Um, I really enjoy building building things, I guess, and not necessarily like physical things. I think I really enjoy building groups. And so like from a professional standpoint, I love the practice management of like building a team. Like how do we get this team to work together? Very, very much like F3. Okay, how do I get all these people to work together in the same direction? We're going to have friction. Like there's going to be a dissent in ideas potentially, but how do we not turn that into a disagreeable environment? And then how do I ultimately turn those dissent or those disagreements to move in the right direction? Right. Just like if I say, Hey, we're going to do a hundred burpees, right? Like no one's going to love that idea. Nobody, right. Even me, but like, maybe we split it up. Maybe we break it up in a tent. Like what, how are we going to do that to accomplish the goal? So at the end of the day, we're kind of all better for it. And so I, I, whether I'm a good at it or not, I enjoy it. And so I think kind of you, you end up getting better at what you enjoy. Um, and so it's, it's something for me that I just, I really, I find cool. Like just to see whether it's, you know, to see our technician step up or to see an optician step. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. Like, I'm so proud of you. Like that to me, that's, that's better than like, I love seeing the financials obviously, but that to me seems more fulfilling at the end of the day. You recently, um, just refinished or, or built an entirely new office. Is that correct? Yeah, so I've got a partner. Um, we we um, built, finished an office in October. So we bought a building about two weeks before COVID hit, and then we were on cloud nine, and then COVID hit, and then that was wild. And so we hung on to it for about a year to make it short and didn't do much with it, and then redid a building. Our practice was in a small downtown area for 60-plus years, and then we moved to, we were in about a 2,000 square foot facility and now we're close to 5,000 square feet, eight exam lanes and we've got an associate. So that just, we're just kind of settling in. We've been in that building, what, eight months now? Mm -hmm. And so that was quite a big undertaking. But kind of what we're doing now is is restructuring. Like, okay, how do I get all these team members on the same page? How are we gonna communicate? Where's our communication structure? Like, how do we do things again? Because it's it's not opening up an open office, but going that big very quickly, the, the leadership and the communication can be, it can make or break, you know, from, from an office standpoint. Yeah. I mean, we're going through similar, similar transition periods right now. So we've got my, my dad who, uh, is going to stop clinical care on July 1st. Uh, he's been two days a week for the last, um, I don't know, a while. Um, and uh, and then I lost our, I don't, um, one of the docs had there. twins. Uh, Dr. Barrett had twins about uh, four months ago now, not quite four months ago, and she's coming back in June. And then we hired a new doctor. Uh, and so we will have 
kind of the same thing, but in the same physical plant that we've always been in. But, you know, um, once, once my dad decided to retire and, um, and I, you know, I bought him out, then, uh, I don't think that there was just some changes that I wanted to make. And it wasn't that I wanted to kind of completely redo stuff, but it, it is that like how many people now we're going to have, instead of having two doctor equivalent days, I wanted to hire a new associate and not have to be like, well, you're just going to get two days and go fill in for someplace else for three days. And I expect that you're going to be in our practice at some point full time. I said, look, we're just going to hire you on. You're going to learn. We'll, it, it'll work itself out. And I, I, I do believe that, but that means that like, how do we have the infrastructure on a couple days a week to handle three doctors when we've only handled two and how do we, um, before and and do we add more people to the team which costs more money and how do you manipulate the footprint but it's really interesting like we're in the process right now of looking at land and and building a building and uh and those sorts of things but it's interesting to see what you can do with the existing space you have and we don't have a small place we have you know we have uh, enough space but just figuring out okay well where's going to be the cogs in the wheel and how do we overcome that is is fun Oh, it's, it's, it's fun. I, I, and like I said, just figuring out how to get people to communicate, like, right. I mean, like, how do you get different people's goals? Right. Cause you have, I kind of look at it as we got three, we've got sort of four separate individual, smaller teams, right. I've got my front desk, which takes, we call it patient intake or patient care. Um, I've got technicians, I've got opticians and I've got insurance, right. Plus I've got a whole doctor. So I got five, like, and those, those all have separate goals. And sometimes those goals can conflict. And then if I give them different goals based on the landscape or the layout or schedule, then it can easily create, because if I'm giving mixed signals and mixed leadership goals, then I can easily be a hindrance to that communication. So it's, it's, it can be time consuming, but it can also be fun when you get the team to click on all cylinders. Oh yeah. This is, this is awesome. You know, it's just, it's, it's so, it's so fun. I I really enjoy that part of it. Do you think the flip side, it can be a headache. Yeah, no, it can. Cause if they're, if they're firing on the wrong cylinders, you know, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, just, just as, yeah. I mean, if again, just as a man, I mean, you can, you can feel when you're off, right. When, when things are just like, golly, this is just, you walk away from clinic that day or just walk away from your day altogether. You know, you reflect at the end of the day, you know, what was my, what was my relationships like today? Was I, was I in this for myself or was I, was I trying to better somebody else's life today uh, in all my encounters? And you can feel like maybe you can't identify it, but it's, it becomes very apparent when you can, can become aware of those things. And so I can, I can completely feel when our office isn't clicking I don't know if everybody else can, but it's not that we're not, you know, we're producing well, um, we're, you know, the, the things are getting done, but there's just something amiss. I can feel that. Um, have you ever really been able to put your finger on that? Yeah. So I, I, I think a lot of it comes down to like, can, did we, were we purposeful of what we did today? Right. So it doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, I was great. Like we could have sold a lot of glasses or seen a lot of patients or had a lot of receipts that that's. That can be great, but that's not necessarily an indicator for was the day purposeful. And like like I said, some days if if I gauge that, it'd be interesting to sit down and like make tallies. Like today, I felt purposeful in what we do, right? But like have conversations and about with your staff or you know just like with F three or with Vision Source. Like did today you meet your goal of being purposeful and impact people's life, regardless of the finances, regardless of the numbers, which is again all important, but did you do that? And some days you, you can say you truthfully did that, and some days like. I just mailed it in today. Like yeah. I didn't do anything wrong, but I just I just wasn't there, um, and and that's hard to do. But your staff feeds off that, right? Like if I'm short and I'm not necessarily in the best mood, and I'm gonna be a jerk, but if I'm not in the best mood, they're gonna feel that, right? And they're gonna feel they're gonna go home and feel just as frustrated as I am, or they might get frustrated at me, and then we might have this other bigger issue. And so I think it's very important, just long term, to think like, okay, today, what is what is my overall goal with this whole thing, right? It, yes, it's seeing patients, but what's the purpose? Like, what am I actually doing here? And, and I think the same thing with, I think really that's why we, we talk about these groups. Like we talk about vision source, we're talking about F3, like we're talking about tree, but like we're not necessarily doing it because of one specific action. Like I'm not just refracting somebody. It's, it's a larger vision of, okay, they're here for a purpose and I'm, I'm going to impact their life whether I like it or not. And so I need to be a positive trajectory as best I can in, in that. Um, and so it's hard though. I mean, some days, you know, it's, it's very hard, you know? Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think there's days where I'll come home and I'll even mention to my wife, Jamie, I'll say, 
you know, like you said, we're not hurting anybody. We're doing a good job, right? You're doing a good job. But I just sit back and I'm like, I just don't feel like I helped anybody today. You know, like, of course you did, but you didn't. It doesn't, and it doesn't have to be like a miracle every day. But, you know, you, sometimes right. you have those days. And sometimes that's a me problem, I suppose, um, where, you know, like you said, it's probably more about what was my purpose for the day. You know, it was my purpose to just kind of get through the day because I know – Today, t- tomorrow is going to be Thursday, and I get to do something. I'm, I'm kind of burnt out for the week, and now I'm going to do something different. Or was it because I had other stuff on my mind that you know about things that weren't important to that moment? Um, and so you just try to have less of those days. But I think uh, being aware of them for me has has helped because when I have those days, I can know like, all right, something was that a miss. I got I got to get right. You know, I, I was I wasn't where I want to be tomorrow's a different day we could start over you know what i mean and i think um you know i think you can get into problems when you don't have that perspective fortunately i i I don't i don't get into those problems but you know i'm intentional about it and i I think i think there's a again we keep going back to vision source and f3 because we're both members of that but i think that are you purposeful and are you fulfilling your own purpose? Whatever that may be, will give you or not give you fulfillment, right? Like if, if you're just an eye doctor and you're mm-hmm. just, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you're saying, listen, I'm just going to go from eight to five. And if that's my goal, and that's my purpose. Cool. You're going to feel fulfilled by that. But kind of like thinking back to at the end of the day, I want to feel fulfilled with whatever I'm doing. Right. And I think having those groups like vision source or F3, not only, makes you be really responsible to yourself about what your purpose is, but also kind of check in with yourself on a regular basis, right? I got, I got people that hold my feet to the fire, right? If we go to a vision source group, you're like, listen, man, you're not coding, right? Like <laughs> you're going to tell me, I'm like, you're right. I'm kind of messing up here. Like, right. Or with F3, like, dude, like if I know you can, if you're mailing in on a workout, right, I'm going to be like, Hey man, like I'm going to give you a hard time. If I know that you're mailing it in or we're going to have a conversation or we might have a vulnerable conversation about, Hey, you know, I'm stressed at home or whatever. And I think all of that kind of plays into it with these groups and kind of, there's a social aspect. I think that we all want to be a part of something. And that also um, will kind of just keep us dr- driving towards that purpose and ultimately being fulfilled. Cause I think that's, that's the issue, right? You, you, you get to the end of your career or your life and, and you don't, you don't find that purpose, that fulfillment. I mean, you look at you can you can find plenty of people in any profession that are just not feeling fulfilled with that because there are there are other missing puzzle pieces that aren't maybe financially tangible, but they're huge in terms of feeling that fulfillment. What do you think is the percentage? If you if you reflect on our profession, in your sense, I mean, we probably run around with the same types of guys, right? If if your situation in in your vision source group is similar to ours, is this may not happen, but when you when you think about the profession in general, um, what, what do you think is the the number of people that are just sort of the, in it to eight to five it, and it's a job to them at this point? Any any sense on that? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know, and and maybe that's because I this may be bad, but maybe I try not to kind of to. To, I don't. I'm not in those circles as much. I don't feel like, and so I try not to maybe get involved with those circles just because I can. I have a tendency to be negative if, like, if I let my own thoughts mm. and kind of I can kind of get involved with that. Me too. Um, and so I don't. I don't know. I, mean, I would love to say it's low, but I, I honestly don't know. I, I could. I feel like if I just spitball, I'm, I'm just completely mm-hmm. being immature with my, with my, um, with my guests. But I think that's every profession. I think that's part of, unfortunately, life. I don't think that's just an optometry thing. Do you think, I think that's that a new thing? Because I agree with you. I think it's probably. It's, I don't. I, I would be not. I wouldn't have the answer either. I'm not trying to lead you down a path. I don't know. Um, sometimes the sense. It, I, I think. I think probably not. By and large, I think probably not. But um, I, or I, I don't think it's very many people uh, are are like that. But I do wonder, like. Um, in the culture, right? Have, have we come to a point where we're seeing more of that now than, um, you know, with, with where there's no kind of sense of cohesiveness, right? We're not all moving toward the same goal or we're not all have the same or even just a vested interest in others. You know, like like I, I, I care about the success of your practice because I care about, I mean, we don't know each other that well, but but because right. I care about you as an individual, right? And, and it doesn't take a lot of back and forth that way. And so have we gotten away from caring? Um, 
has it been is it easier to not care uh, from a cultural standpoint? Those are heavy questions, man. We're going deep here. I mean, <laughs> we can stop I think so. I mean, I, I, no, no, you're fine, man. I, 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 um, I feel like I'm in my first F3 workout. I feel so unprepared. Like I know there's going to be workouts, but I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> um, I, I, I think we are in a great profession. I think most people, I would agree with you, are happy and that don't just clock in and clock out. I mean, I think most optometrists are very caring, um, good hearted people that really want to do the right thing and will go above and beyond for each and every patient. So I don't think it's even a large minority of people that are ups, uh, kind of unhappy. But I think you're right. I think culturally there's something to this, the the way that, you know, if you think of just the Internet and how social media and our phones have, have changed things, we're instantly connected to people, but we're also so far away from everybody from from a community standpoint. Like, so... A little bit about us. We moved. From, I practiced in Atlanta for about four years, and it's great, and it's a cool town, and it's awesome. And we had all these people around us, but we're not from there. But we had this very small circle of friends that we knew from college, right? And I'm in this huge city of millions of people, right? And then I moved to a small town of like 10,000 people, and I have immediately a much more connected community that are really, really, truly invested in my kids besides like in, in Atlanta, I was like a handful of people we went to college with. So like those are college buddies. It was great. But now I have these people that don't even know me. Right. But we have this immediate connection. And I think to some degree, kind of what you're saying is like, there is this disconnect. And I think that bleeds over to some of this fulfillment, right? Like how, what's your village? Like your whether you have, uh, we have, I know you have kids too. I have kids too. Like how do you build your village around yourself? Right. Professionally, and personally, and I think that does have a lot to do with your happiness, right? Because if I'm just going about this alone, the struggles are going to get a lot harder. Like the, the struggles every day are going to get a lot harder than if I'm doing it kind of with a group or at least somebody who can understand my struggles. But listen, I've been there. You know, I hear you. We're having the same issues. We can bounce ideas off each other. And so I think that can make it harder when you feel kind of isolated, you know? I don't know if that answers your no, question. No, I think it I does. Think, I, think, I think you're right. I think, I think it's easier. Something. I think it's easier to be isolated now. I mean... Look, you you know you could you can click off this button in the next few minutes when we're all done, and you can forget about this conversation all day long. I suspect you won't, and I won't either. But it's like you said, it's easy to just kind of go to the ne- go to the next thing, go to the next thing. I mean, I can look at my I can look at my list of to dos today, and yeah. um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm going to be a task ma- I hate it. Today is going to be a day that I'm just going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. I'm not going to be able to sit back and, and usually Thursdays are a day where I actually like to sit back and reflect a little bit and kind of think about, like you said, how's our team doing? How can we do things better? Or is there an idea that we're not using doing right now that we can integrate? Um, and, you know, I've just got meeting after meeting after meeting, right? And it's not that I don't want yep. to be at those meetings. It just means that if that was my day, five days a week, and that's all I did, uh, or that was, yeah, that, I think that would be really, for me, it would be really hard. It would be really hard. And I think it is, um, you know, the, the old thing of, like, you can make excuses for a lot of stuff, right? Like, we've heard all of them, right? It's too early. It's too dark. It's too rainy. It's too cold. I'm not in good enough shape. <laughs> Or, um, but, but those, those are issues that we all, that anybody could say. Yeah. Same thing is like, you know, do I want to, do I want to, uh, integrate a new piece of technology into my practice or do I want to integrate vision therapy in my practice or scleral lenses or whatever? Um, boy, that's going to be difficult. I don't know if I can do that. Am I, am I the kind of guy that can do that? And, uh, you know, and, and then if you don't have a support system around you to, to reinforce those things, <laughs> it's very difficult. I'll tell you, I think that's where people struggle. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's kind of, so I, I, I was talking to somebody else and I kind of said this, like, you know, if you, if you come to F3 and are you hurt, are you injured? Right. And there's a, there's a, there's, there's similar words, but they're very different. Like, are you truly injured? If so, that's stopping you I get it. Right. And that's a, a roadblock Hmm. to doing this. Like you need to stop, but you're just hurting. That's a little bit different, right? Like, and that's kind of the same thing professionally. Like, is this something that's truly going to injure my like professional success or is there just going to be some discomfort, which I don't love and I really don't like it, but ultimately it's probably going to push me through. And I think, I think that's hard. It's easy when you're doing something physical, like, okay, my leg's broken. I'm injured. I'm out. 
I know that, right? Versus like professionally, it's like, okay, well, I've got all these staff issues. I've got these monetary issues. I know I should do it, but these are all roadblocks. So I'm done. I'm out. That's it. And it's like, it's very easy to do that. And that's, that's a, that's a much, much more harder to navigate situation because there are things that, I mean, I know I should do with our practice. I'm like, well, I'm not going to do it right now because I'm not going to do it. Like, it's just, it's part of life. What's your why? What's your why in practice? In, in practice, do you, what's your identity? So my personal one or our practice one? Let's start with your practice we just went. So we just went through this. We're using traction. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. We went to, yeah. And so it's huge. We're in the middle of traction and kind of overwhelmed right now with all we have going on, honestly, because we're trying to do all these things and do enough to make people uncomfortable, which we probably tend to do a little too much too aggressively mm. as, a, as a leadership group. Mm. And so then the staff kind of pulls back. So we're in the midst of that. But um, right, we went through it, and our little tagline that we figured out is is just be awesome. Like, be we're going to be essentially try to be the best we can be. And that looks different for every single patient encounter, right? So for a couple years, we've told our staff, like, I want to be the best practice in the state. I, I like, And I don't mean that in terms of financial. I don't mean the biggest or the best, but, like, we are in this small town and you need to be able to walk into our t- our office and feel like you could walk into Charlotte or Raleigh or Atlanta or wherever, New York, I don't care. But in terms of, a, of what you're offered, in terms of how you're cared about, like that is the feel that we're going for. And so we've, after back and forth, we kind of just said, that's what it is. Like, just be awesome, right? And if that's handling a, a patient that's upset, be awesome at it. I don't know what that looks like, but figure it out, right? If that's taking going above and beyond and seeing the our, our patient or whatever you're going to do like kind of that is kind of what or w- exactly what we want our staff to do and our staff is very good about you know elderly patient walking in they'll go get an umbrella and walk them in and it's just like that's that's amazing like that's exactly what it is it has no revenue generating amount but that is going to completely differentiate and that's kind of what we want to be about um, and that's kind of hard sometimes because you know, both of us understand that there's a lot of financial impact that we have to watch, right? We have to make sure we're m- watching those numbers. Um, and that's sometimes hard because you have these financial conversations with your staff and you're like, hey, here's what we're doing. And it can sometimes get lost in translation because you're talking about all these definable metrics. But at the end of the day, that has it has a lot to do with it, but not necessarily what you're going for in terms of bringing back to, again, the purpose. Like I have to do that to fix my to get to my purpose, but the purpose is... We want to be awesome in how we how we approach how we approach patient care. I love that. I think I think um, that I think is a little bit unusual. I, I started asking this question when I when I'm talking. I'll you know especially like if I'm doing a protocol, if I'm talking about like right now it's dry eye, if it's myopia management, if it's <clears throat> I ask I ask the question. If I look around this room, how many of you believe you are the best place in your community? to get eye care and you know i'll get a couple hands go up and and they don't go up like they don't shoot up right they're kind of like this they're a little bit afraid to to admit it and i and i often as i'm talking about it and then i'll i'll say do you know if i was in a room of of cataract surgeons the worst cataract surgeon in your community if i ask that if i ask that question their hands are going to shoot up and I think there's I think there's a lot of things that are enduring about our profession that that actually make it make it so that we're a little bit timid to to put that out there. Um, it doesn't mean that you are that like you know if you believe you're the best and you put that out there like if you're going to be awesome you have to live up to that if that if that is something that you're really going to hold yourself to you have to live up to it. And so in a lot of ways it, it's not an arrogant statement. I think it can come off that way. I think it can come off like I'm not going to raise yeah. my hand really high cuz I don't want everybody to think I'm a you know, I'm a, a weirdo or, or arrogant. But um, but it if you really believe that, that means you have to put your money where your mouth is. So you're going to have to right. you're going to even if you're so like what what that entails is if if I don't do dry eye in my practice, but when you come into my practice, I'm the best place for you if you have dry eye because I'm going to figure out if I can't fix it, somebody else is going to fix right. it, right? And so that's a, exactly. it's just a different mentality, and I just I think that's where people struggle is they they haven't identi- they had, haven't identified whatever it is. It may not be being awesome, right? But whatever that thing is, <clears throat> then it it makes you kind of float in the wind, right? Because if you're going to be awesome and somebody comes in with a problem, it's very easy. To, to figure out like I, I've got to be awesome I got to make this problem go away for this patient right right and um, 
but if it's like oh, I don't know, we're we're you know we don't really have a clear identity as a practice, so I'm not really sure how to handle this. How would Doctor you know, Pinkston think if I do this? And man, that's going to cost two hundred fifty dollars because I'm going to have to give him a refund. So, were you awesome? Right? Yeah. Then you were awesome. Yeah. Okay, done. And then and you never have to worry about that stuff. Right. And I think you're right. I think optometrists in general, we don't want to be seen as cocky or arrogant. And sometimes, like I'm sure I get kind of called that one a little bit when I speak because I get very impassionate about it and I think it's very important I think that the disclaimer in anything like that is like I'm not trying to be awesome at your expense like so if you and I are even if we have vision source practices in the same town it's not that I want my practice to be better at the expense of your practice that's not all I'm saying I'm saying is I want my practice to be the best practice that I can possibly build for my practice which might look different than your practice like so like I might not do IPLs or sclerals or whatnot. If I get my hands in it, we are going to go completely into deep end of the pool. Like we're jumping in all in and we're going to figure it out. But until then, if we're across town, like, hey, Chris does a lot better job with that. He is awesome at that. And you're going to be in much better hands. And that's kind of knowing kind of knowing what you're good at, in my opinion. Like, right, like figuring out, okay, I'm, we're really good at this. We're really good at this avenue of eye care. We are going to be we're going to be the best, and frankly, we're probably going to be our competitors at it. But that doesn't mean that that takes anything away from our competitors either. They're going to be better at other things, and and I think that's okay. Like that's perfectly fine. Like we all have colleagues that like are better at us at certain things, that, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. Like I wish them the best of success, and I want to refer that. I want to have a practice that I can build, that I can have referrals for. If you're doing IPLs and I don't do that, cool. There you go. Here it is. I'll send them all to you. Like take care of the patient like I would and we can have a good thing going here. And so I think that's really important that it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it comes at anybody's spells. Just like your, like your F3 thing. Like if we're doing pushups out there or burpees or whatever, it's not that I'm, I'm trying to beat you. I'm trying to, to push my limit. And then if I happen to, to finish first or you happen to finish first, so be it. We kind of come together at the end and we circle up and it's still, we're all kind of part of this collective community. Yeah, man. I think, I think that's, I think that's it. And I think it has to be built on trust, right? Like your, you know, you made the point of, um, you made the point of not caring about the guy across the street, you know, or across your town that that's a vision source doctor or not. Right. I mean, frankly, you know, I think there's the, there, I, I do really believe that a rising tide rises all ships. And so it doesn't, or elevates all ships. Uh, it doesn't have to come at the expense of someplace else. I think where it does rub people wrong is if they if they don't believe that the other person has their best interest at heart. That's where I think it becomes a challenge, and that's where I think right. Vision Source and F three, if we're going to su- cycle back to that point, it, it eliminates the the um, the curiosity about whether or not somebody has your best interest at heart. Right when they give you advice or they ask advice. They, you, you have been through enough hard things with them to know that they, um, they're going to give you genuine advice and they're going to ask for it when they need it. I think that's really important. Right. Yeah. And being vulnerable, right? Like being vulnerable too. like, listen, I, I'm, you know, if somebody calls you up and they think you have a great practice and you're like, listen, I, that's not, not my thing. Like I, and I think even that, like sometimes we can, you know, we can put people on pedestals like, okay, that guy, he's got it all figured out. Right. And you call him up, you ask the rice bag, man, I don't, I have no idea what to do there. Like you're in a tough spot. And then to some degree, I wish I had an answer sometimes, but whether it's personally or professionally, I'm like, okay, not everybody has it figured out. And that's, that's okay. Like there's this mystique of that everything's perfect and that's just not the case professionally and personally you know yeah ted uh ted mcelroy does a really good job about articulating this stuff and i've learned a lot from him is you know um as i've aged i've kind of uh i i want more input from from outside i want more you know when i um there was a while that you could say well he's he's just a hot shot you know i know everything and then once you realize, like, at some point you flip and you don't know everything anymore, and then you acknowledge you don't know everything, and that's where it, that's where it becomes really fun. And I don't know when that was. It's been a few years, quite a few years now. But, uh, you know, having other people come in and say, hey, what do you think about my practice? Um, and what do you think about, uh, like, how should we do things? And making them experts to your team uh, has been a lot of fun and um and super rewarding and just an area of growth that I never 
you know, you, you, at some point in your, in your life, you, you think you've got everything figured out and then until you realize you don't. And, uh, and it's just so much, so much more fun that way. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, like I said, that's why kind of what you were saying, like, what's your purpose? Like that's, I think that's the, the pushing, pushing, pushing yourself and your practice, you know, your family, just yourself to be better. Like, I think that's all what we're all trying to do. I think everybody's trying to do that in their own different way until you figure out what that looks like and how you articulate that. I think that's the key part, you know, it's figuring out what you know, where you're at and where you're at on that journey, you know. Dr. Pinkston, that's that's a great way to finish this. Although, because we were talking about F3, I think we should inter- finish this like we would normally finish an F3 workout. So I'll let you go. All right. Jordy, thir- Jordy, 36, Tommy Pinkston. Christopher Wolf, 40, Cataracts. <laughs>